It is the duty of the free man to resist tyranny at every turn. Every man will either watch his freedom stripped away or take action to protect what he loves. Introducing the A3, the newest revolutionary body armor from Armored Republic. The A3 is the new standard for lightweight multi-hit body armor. A3 plates are incredibly light at 4.6 pounds. The patented design captures fragmentation while remaining multi-hit capable. The A3 will stop up to M80 ball, yet comes in at only 0.7 inches thick. The A3 is the thinnest NIJ.06 compliant or certified composite standalone plate that includes the drop test. The A3 is the first of its kind, patent pending, that combines an alloy strike face with polyethylene backing, revolutionizing body armor technology by providing strength and durability while remaining sleek and maneuverable. The A3 is the new standard in lightweight body armor. The fight against tyranny just got stronger. Hey y'all, welcome to Cross Baltic on the Fight Lab Feast Network. This is one of those shows where you might have missed some of this in the news. Oh. Even though, I mean, the Durham Report, we're going to talk about the Durham Report today. We're going to talk about Gorsuch's opinion on the Mayorkas versus Arizona opinion. There's a, there's actually some big things that have happened that I feel like kind of has kind of gone under the radar a little well, bit. Well, I've been out of the loop, too, because we've been making stuff. Yeah, so yeah, I true. get caught up. Pastor yeah. Toby Chuck Knox, I'm the water boy. We got uh, uh, our our lawyer on retainer, Davis Yance. <laughs> Uh, Ooh, on, yeah, retainer. On, on retainer. We must pay him in Oreos uh, <laughs> <laughs> and ice cream. And ice cream. That's it. <laughs> Little ice cream. I'm pretty sure we owe him a lot of Oreos. <laughs> Today's yeah. culture shifts like sand, but New St. Andrews College is established on Christ, the immovable rock. The college is a premier institution that forges evangelical leaders who don't fear or hate the world. Guided by God's word, equipped with the genius of classical liberal arts and God-honoring wisdom, with a faculty dedicated to academic rigor and to God's kingdom, New St. Andrews College offers an education that frees people. Logic and language, hard work and joyful courage, old books and godly professors, New St. Andrews College provides time-tested resources that can equip your student for any vocation. Find out more today and even schedule a visit. At nsa.edu. That's nsa.edu. What you, you guys mentioned this before? Before I introduce yeah, Davis, yeah. you've been working on some stuff. Oh man, oh, yes. what, what have you guys been working? A lot of work. You guys went out of town for a couple of days. You've been working on yeah. for the for the club pub. Yeah, it's not the club pub. It's the it's the it's the it's not bad. The pub pub the pu- TV pub TV. Yeah. So a, a couple couple things. One is our app. We're shooting for June first, but it's it might end up being sometime in June. Uh, for our app update. Excuses, it's just the, excuses. It's just the way technology, um, uh-huh. but what we're doing for our app update, we're actually, um, this is how it works on iTunes. You just replace just the update. old app with the new app. So it's, up- actually a new, it's not just an update. It's actually a new system. So right. you're going to wake up sometime in June with a whole, with a whole new, new app. app. So yeah. there's some technology, yeah. you know, I don't know, magic, magic guru, magic that magic. happens, yeah. where we'll replace the current app that you have on your phone with a whole new app. But and you guys filmed so, a, a, a new episode of This America. This America. Yeah. So we were at uh, Maddox uh, Transformers, really great facilities in Battleground, Washington. Love wow. what they're doing out there. C.R. Wiley is the pastor of the church out there. Yeah. Um, uh, Camden Spiller is the CEO, and we filmed a, a really cool episode of This America, and we're going to be... Uh, uh, we got another three or four slated, hopefully before. Okay. Um, I got. T- I just got, July. I got to give a little and, bit of preview. And, of this. and then we're getting into a cooking show. Okay. Yeah. That's that too. Which that's is awesome. uh, the title of our cooking show is um, uh, Soul Craft with Food. Soul Craft with Food. Yeah. Isn't that good. Okay. I got. I got to talk about that's Maddox good. real quick though. Okay. So we're out there. And they get these transformers that are all beat up and rusted yeah. through and yeah. not really good for anything else anymore. And they like take like them. these big transformers. There's big transformers. Big ones, they yeah. pick them. They open them up and they gut them. Yep. Right? They rebuild everything. They paint them. They put the guts back in all new and then they pour oil inside of it because that's how it works and runs with oil. Do it and, with oil. And, and, Mineral oil. I mean, y'all, I'm telling you, it's like straight gospel. Yeah. The spirit comes taking in. Taking the heart out. <laughs> taking that heart. <laughs> put the stone, spirit back in it. Put the man. heart oh, of Jesus. Oh my goodness, man. Let me Baptize tell you that thing. Anoint it with oil. I was watching this whole thing come together. I was like, man, God, you just have the gospel in everything in yeah. the world. It's just telling yeah, us I mean, the story. Electronic it's so tra- good, transformers. Man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man, Can't wait to show that. Yeah, uh, Man, I'm looking forward to seeing 
in it. We're grateful to have with us Attorney Davis Yance. He's a former military officer providing legal guidance and expert criminal defense to military members, in particular federal law enforcement and other patriots. He's a former prosecutor, JAG lawyer, number one rated defense counsel in the Air Force. Oh, runs a focused legal practice helping Americans preserve their religious freedom, equal protection under the law, and basic constitutional rights in criminal and administrative proceedings. Attorney Davis Yunts, welcome back to Cross Politic. Gentlemen, thank you. Good to be here. Man, I feel like we needed some applause or something for that type you know, of opening. I don't even know if I have anything I mean, like that. I, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't. Maybe maybe Davis is actually. You know, the one thing we could do is we could get him his own music. I, was, I guess he's been here enough he's now. Been I enough, have to yeah. give him his own get, theme. We should give him his own intro music. Mm-hmm. Uh, Davis, um, recently the Supreme Court handed down the uh, Arizona versus Mayorkas decision, and uh, and first of all, we need you to explain to us what that was about. But the thing that we particularly were interested in talking to you about was um, Neil Gorsuch yeah. wrote the yeah. um, uh, majority opinion, and apparently he leveled both barrels at our COVID um, tyranny. Um, can you? Can you? I mean, it was so it was so good that Slate's mad at him and, and, and writing. <laughs> he uh, did something right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So can you can you break down what happened for us there? Yeah, so we'll start with the decision. This all relates to something called Title 42. This was a Trump administration policy put out during COVID that said, hey, there there is a way to use the COVID emergency to keep um, in the country. So those who were coming across illegally be out of the country as well as legal immigrants could be kept out of the country during COVID. They used this Title 242 emergency procedure. So what happened is the Biden administration came in and they wanted to lift this procedure that was in place. And so 19 state attorney generals sued and they said, we don't want you to lift this. We want you to keep it in place. What happened is the Supreme Court was waiting to issue a ruling on this when the COVID emergency officially ended on May 11th. Right. So Congress passed uh, legislation that said the COVID emergency is over. Biden administration signed it. So the Supreme Court said, okay, good. Now we don't have to weigh into this Title 42 issue. It's moot. The case doesn't need because there is no longer an emergency. That's that's the backdrop for this. Okay. What happened is almost unprecedented. I can't say it is unprecedented, but it is highly, highly unusual. Gorsuch went out and put everyone in the country on blast and not the majority opinion, simply a statement. Uh, That's really, really rare. Normally for the Supreme Court, you see uh, the majority opinion, then you might see a dissenting opinion or a concurring opinion. What Gorsuch did is this is an eight page statement and it reveals something I've been hoping is true for a long time. He might actually be a libertarian. Like he might have those <laughs> leanings and be on the United States Supreme Court. Wow. So that's that's the backdrop for what he did. And I think he particularly he doesn't mention gay by name, but he does talk <laughs> about people exercising their religious freedom oh. and being potentially criminally prosecuted for it in wow. this statement. So that's pretty interesting too. Interesting. So the, so the statement and so can you walk us through a little bit like what are some of the highlights? I mean, you said um, you think he might, we might have a libertarian on the Supreme <laughs> Court. Um, what are some of the highlights of this? I mean, he mentions people who are being prosecuted or potentially prosecuted for religious um, practice. Um, what are some of those places where you say, like, when he hit this, like, you know, I wanted to stand on my chair and sing when he said <laughs> yeah. this, you know, this, this is what I was, you know, I was tweeting to all my friends. I mean, what were some of the high points of that statement that Gorsuch issued? Well, one thing he said, he just put he put everybody on blast over emergency powers. He said, look, we cannot use an emergency to just have an unlimited attack on civil rights and basic human freedom. He said, that's just unacceptable in our nation. So he said, hey, there might be a time when it's appropriate for an emergency, but we can't do that. And he also said, we need to stop using fake emergencies or one emergency to create another problem. Mm, so everything yep. about this statement is just fascinating because he recognizes there's a crisis on the border. And he says, hey, we're not going to use a non-existent COVID emergency order to deal with one crisis. The crisis at hand needs to be dealt with. So he's putting the on blast. This is Supreme Court justice recognizing there's a crisis on the border. But then he walks through the logic of all of this and says, look, what happened during COVID cannot happen again. We cannot let it pass. And he walked through everything. I mean, he walked through governors issuing emer- unending, indefinite emergency wow. orders. He issued 
he issued just a blistering critique of courts allowing that to happen. And that's where people are saying he's blasting the Supreme Court. Um, and then he says, hey, legislatures, where were you? Why weren't you acting? Why wow. weren't you using your constitutional guaranteed powers and rights to do this? And he just he walked through it methodically. I mean, he even blasts states that closed churches and opened casinos. Right. I mean, Ooh. that's the kind of detail we're talking about, the fidelity he had on this. And and in reality, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, Gorsuch was criticized during COVID because he wasn't wearing a mask yeah. during a Supreme Court session, you know, yeah. and the other the other justices, I think it was Kagan, criticized him. She was worried and he just he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't wear a mask. So mm-hmm. there's this this willingness on Gorsuch's part to issue a statement has no legal authority. This is r- literally him putting his opinion on these issues out there. And putting everyone on notice, this is how he's going to be analyzing these issues in the future. So, so don't don't forget this. Like the emergency powers just ended May eleventh, twenty twenty three. Yeah, that's what that's what just happened. And then the Supreme Court, you know, a week later says, "Well, we don't got to rule on this anymore because the power is over." Yeah. But May eleventh, twenty twenty three, which and that included like our Canadian friends couldn't come over the border. Yeah, I mean, I'm without I'm, being vaxxed. Right. Right. That was a yeah. that was an American thing. That yeah. wasn't a Canadian yeah. thing. Right. Did you all have celebrations on May 12th? <laughs> no. <laughs> For the end of the emergency. No, I know. Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear we no alarms. Sure. I mean, because then... usually when there's an emergency, like you kind of notice. <laughs> right. And then you're yeah. like, oh, good. The emergency's over. Yeah. yeah. Except we I, didn't. None of us did. I didn't that. Either. So, right. so, so Davis, you just mentioned that it, it's, it wasn't a deciding an opinion. It wasn't, there wasn't, yeah. le- it wasn't a legal statement. statement. It, was, it was a statement. But what impact does this have, you know, on the court systems and on, let's say, even the legislators? Well, I think it sends a strong signal that as long as Gorsuch is going to be very, very critical of emergency actions taken by the federal government, he is going to continue to advocate for slowing down, doing things properly, doing things by the letter of the law, and just not using an emergency to to get away with anything or to shut down processes. So he is signaling very, very strongly, and he's also signaling he's not going to he's not going to shut up about it. I mean, again, I can't emphasize how unusual this is. He is issuing a statement that is literally laying out his opinion for the future, not not that has any legal binding. He's just criticizing what we did, the way we did it. I mean, he talks about the military, he talks about the threat of dis- discharging court martial of the military in an emergency and just frames it in such a way that how could we have been that foolish? Mm. How could we do this? And he's not wrong. I mean, the point I don't I want people to understand is literally today. The governor of North Carolina has declared an emergency as an effort to try to stop a school choice bill from passing in North Carolina. I I mean, that's this is exactly what Gorsuch is talking about. I don't even understand what the emergency is. I tried to look at some of the news on it. I don't even understand the logic of it. But that's exactly what he's talking about. This unprecedented use of emergency powers to just take away liberties isn't going to stand for it. You know, Davis, clearly, this is interesting because you're right. It is unprecedented. But I guess if you have both sides running to emergency powers to try and use that, because part of the well, whole and Trump ran, but right, that, that's the whole point of this whole. 42. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And so they're using, it. and then you have states saying, "Hey, you know what? We want to still try and use this emergency power because we're not dealing with, you know, the run of the border. And so if we keep this intact, it might give us a chance. So we're everybody's using it one way or another. This isn't like, you know, oh, good for conservatives. No, conservatives are using it in the same way that liberals are, just to try and get things done because we're having a problem with our legislators. I'm guessing that's where it's ending up at. But um, what what do you expect? Um, what do you expect now will be the play? If you're not going to get a chance to use emergency powers, is this going to make everybody going back to playing the game normal? I mean, hopefully it does, and hopefully it slows things down. I mean, that's the sign that Gorsuch writes talks about the people, the authority of the people, and really is saying, "Hey, look, over time, the wisdom of the people to be better at making these decisions." Now, I'm not going to agree with him theologically on all of this, but he really is a constitutional scholar. That's really what he's going back to. So as long as he sits on the Supreme Court, he's kind of so that he is going to call balls and strikes based on the law and the Constitution, and he's not going to get caught up in this. And it's unfortunate. I mean, we're dealing, again, huge crisis at the border. I understand all of these states' attorney general trying to do anything to slow down an invasion at the southern border and deal with this. 
But Gorsuch is saying, hey, we shouldn't be using one emergency to deal with another emergency. We should actually be honest and deal with the issues that are at hand, deal with issues straight on and not use, you know, neither side should be using lies or subterfuge to get the point across. So Gorsuch, Gorsuch said in in his opinion, he said this is one of this is uh, probably one of the greatest intrusions on our civil liberties in the history of the United States. Slate responds and says, hey, Gorsuch doesn't know his history about slavery. And Jim Crow laws. Uh, what's your response to to that equivocation? We were this close. <laughs> Whenever you lock people in their own houses and tell them they can't come out, yeah. you this close. Yeah, exactly. You understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Davis. He asked you, not me. He asked you. <laughs> no, I, I mean I agree when you when you look at lockdowns, but but look, I mean, walk through everything that happened. I mean, Gabe, look what you were arrested for, <laughs> right? You were arrested because it was an emergency. I'm not even sure we still know why you were arrested, right? Mm-hmm. Like the real reason. It yeah. was a moving justification. But that was the thing. I mean, remember, we're sitting in our houses afraid to leave our houses in Pennsylvania. We were afraid to go out and, and we literally, you know, they were arresting in this area, arresting people, pulling people over for leaving their homes. And so that, I mean, I, I, I have a hard time disagreeing with him when we talk about people losing their jobs. And again, he goes into detail. He's like, we're shutting down churches. People are getting arrested for public displays, legal, otherwise legal public displays of their faith. And, and we're going to throw military members in prison, in military right. prison, because of their religious faith, because they're taking a stand against this when it's unlawful. I mean, he lays it out, he addresses the issues, and he gives specific examples. So uh, hopefully that's instructive. Hopefully it carries weight. Was that, um, was Gorsuch, did he do a mistake here? Like, did it, does this kind of ruin like his ethos or some of his authority as a Supreme Court by releasing a statement like this? I'm um, I mean, that's what people are going to argue, right? They're going to say, you know, this is political commentary. This is something else. But I, I think you're seeing from him, uh, it, look at his history. If you go back and look at Gorsuch, he's always been a writer. He's always been a thinker. He's always been willing to put his thoughts on paper and put it out there. But I think really this is a warning. I think this will go down in history, perhaps as a warning to the country and a warning to everyone else. Look at what we're doing. So again, don't know Gorsuch personally, but I do think he absolutely feels so strongly about this. He's not going to compromise on these issues mm. and he's going to put it out there. He's going to say it. He's going to make it part of the public record and discussion. And I don't think he, I think he was more concerned about this and about basic civil liberty is about his reputation, what people think of him. He's demonstrated that in the past with some of his unpopular rulings. Wow. I think he's going to do that again with this issue. Wow. Davis, um, you said this is nearly unprecedented. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, wh- what does this rank up there with? Are there, are there, are there any other um, situations like this where Supreme Court justices have issued statements, you know, unnecessarily, but, you know, but putting out their opinion, feeling this strongly about some issue. Um, is there any, are there any precedents and, and does that tell us anything about just how unprecedented this is? There are very few situations. It's just what's so rare about it is that he issued it in the form of a statement because procedurally the whole decision in this this case for the Supreme Court is less than a paragraph. It's basically this issue before us that we have oral argument on is now moot on here. That's it. And then, you know, and then there was a very uh, Justice Brown did a very, very short. Uh, I dissent for reasons I've already talked about before. And then he does this statement. So again, legally, it, it normally we're used to justice is dissenting. And we've seen scathing opinions in dissenting opinions. We've even seen scathing language in concurring opinions from Justice Thomas. Yeah. But to just issue a statement to outline these issues, it's very, very rare. And it only comes from someone who is just, I mean, absolutely, mm. it, it's couch which he's very articulate writer he's a very thoughtful writer he's trying to make it intellectual but this is a scathing rebuke of what happened and the infringement on civil rights and just the inaction by so many so many political leaders so can we get into the Durham report you guys anything else Uh, I was going to say speaking of 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 having our civil liberties taken away yeah. by a corrupt government. Exactly. Oh, here we go. All right. Exactly. Um, uh, a, a, a week or so ago, the Durham report came out. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I think it's this is kind of. I mean, it goes back um, like 2015, years. 16. Um, kind of recounting and trying to figure out who knew what when. Um, with all the 
um, you know, Russian collusion accusations, the impeachment um, of President Trump, the dossier uh, files, the, all these yeah. things. Um, have you been following this? And 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 Davis, what um, what's your take? I mean, what does the Durham report uh, tell us? Uh, and what it, time frame is it covering? Kind of give us yeah, some, uh, some context what, here. What, yeah, yeah. What's the broad information yeah. um, and and takeaway points um, for you? So yeah, the the Durham report is this this long standing investigation. It goes back all the way to 2015, hmm. and. So what happened previously is there was a special counsel appointed to do an investigation into Trump's Russian collusion, right? This was the big issue in the 2016 presidential campaign. None of those investigations, none of the impeachment ever uncovered any evidence of Russian collusion on the part of Donald Trump. Just there was never any evidence there. So the best way to understand where the Durham report is at is the Durham report was a special counsel appointed to say, was there ever ever any evidence and was there misconduct on the part of any senior political leaders on the White House, on the FBI in into that that kicked off this whole um, crossfire hurricane was the name of the investigation in Trump conclusions. And and the summary, the summary of the Durham report is, yes, there was misconduct. There was wrongdoing. The FBI was weaponized and used as a political tool to influence the outcome of an election and Durham has emails, text messages, transcripts of meetings, contemporaneous memos from meetings wow. that demonstrate that the Obama administration, Vice President Biden, colluded with the Clinton campaign to create a false story that never had evidentiary support at all that kicked off the Russian collusion. That's the big takeaway from 316 pages. Uh, 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 so, oh, my so, goodness. So somebody going to jail. I, brother, I I can't even begin to to see how that's not going to happen, but 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 we'll see. I mean, I mean, we live in upside down times. I mean, here's the way I started to look at it. That that's the reaction I had when I started to read it. Like, how many people are going to jail? Look, there's a guy, Douglas Mackey, is is going to jail. He's been prosecuted by the federal government for election interference because he he put out yes. satirical memes yes. right we've talked about this case before oh. Douglas Mackey was charged she's facing 10 years in federal prison for interfering with the outcome of election for satirical memes prosecuted by our federal government now we have proof that there was a meeting <laughs> director of the FBI people from the CIA the president the vice president who were given a briefing by the CIA that the Clinton campaign is planning to put out a hoax a Russian collusion hoax to distract from Hillary Clinton's own email scandal. And within days, almost immediately, with no evidence to support it, that's what the Durham report says, there's never any credible evidence. The FBI opens up an investigation during the election and then leaks information to the press. So there's a lot more details to go into. That's the big picture. But but what occurred to me this morning, and I was just kind of laughing as I was thinking about it, is look... The FBI, what is the name of the headquarters building? What's the name on the headquarters building for the FBI? Is it Hoover? It's the Hoover building. It's the Hoover building. Yeah. Yeah. J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Listen, we still have J. Edgar Hoover on a building. When we know for a fact, historically, J. Edgar Hoover was, if nothing else, a political power in me who used blackmail and used all of his assets to get blackmail on opponents. I mean, we have we have historical proof. Lyndon Johnson and Ed, J. Edgar Hoover combined to sp spy on the Goldwater campaign, mm -hmm. right? So everyone knows that. Yep. That's all established historical fact. And we still have an FBI with Hoover's name on the building. So in part, I'm like, okay, perhaps they're just being true to who they are yeah. if, if we're still going to approach it that way. But we have to tear down all the statues of uh, Stonewall Jackson. Yeah. Maybe we need to have a medical emergency or something and like that to get rid of that. Robert E. Lee. At what point, at what point is like, like the FBI a treasonous organization? Well, and, and again, make a case. You could sit down and start to go through the Durham report and ask the question, you know, people are using language, a coup, that this was the equivalent of a coup using the senior FBI leaders to gather this information to intentionally leak it. Cause here's where it gets really bad. Here's where it gets worse. There's evidence that shows the FBI would leak information to the media, right? They'd leak information to the media. The media would report that information about the Russian collusion. And then the FBI would take information from the media, including news media stories, and use that 
yes. as evidence yeah. before the FISA court yep. to right. get warrant permission to do this. And that's not speculation. There is right. Klein Smith. There was a OGC attorney working with the FBI who was criminally prosecuted and convicted because he intentionally altered an email in order to get a FISA court warrant against a member of the Trump campaign. That was Carter Page. Yeah. So again, they, there's proof that individuals working on this case altered evidence. They committed a federal crime in doing that. But again, the bigger picture is the media collusion on this. They would leak information to the media, then use the media as a source to try to get probable cause for warrants to spy on um, the Trump campaign. Dave, uh, and, and, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, there's so much here. There's 316 pages here. Yeah. But I mean, again, remember the name Papadopoulos. I don't know if you guys yeah, remember yeah, the name yeah, Papadopoulos. Yeah, yeah. This was an unpaid advisor. This is an unpaid advisor to the Trump campaign. He was one of the people that was targeted in this if, as if he was a foreign agent. But our own FBI tried to use, they tried to use informants, and they even tried to use a honeypot scam mm -hmm. on Papadopoulos to get information, right? So they they try to get him to have an affair with a with a beautiful young woman, just what the Chinese do to yeah. members of Congress like Eric Swalwell. Like th that's what the, our own FBI tried to do that with Papadopoulos. It didn't work in that case, um, but that's what happened here. So there's there's a ton here. Bottom line. Clearly, the FBI was used as a political tool. They showed favoritism to the Clinton campaign, and they opened up an investigation with no credible evidence. Wow. Um, real quick, before you guys yeah. you, you, hold, hold your hold, hold, uh, yeah, hold, hold, yeah, yeah. yeah. hold, hold that thought. Are you subscribed to our cross politic email list? Because if you're not, you really should be. Being subscribed to our email list means you won't miss any updates about Cross Politic or the Fight Laugh Feast Network. You'll hear about what's on the schedule for the week, live events, conference updates, rowdy Christian merch, updates from other shows within the Fight Laugh Feast Network, and you'll hear from sponsors on the show as they seek to take dominion for God's kingdom in the business world. To subscribe, simply enter your email address at the bottom of the page at fightlaughfeast.com. Again, go to fightlaughfeast.com, scroll down to the bottom, there's a place where you can enter email address and never miss anything from your friends at Cross Politic and the Fight Laugh Feast Network. It seems to me that Trump wasn't very good at draining the swamp then. If this happened in 2015, 2016. Well, that's one thing. Yeah, I think you're right about that. You know, and then Trump had four years to fix the FBI. And now the current director of the FBI is a Trump appointed director who's um, using the FBI to go after all these pro-life activists. Yeah. This is a big failure on Trump's part. I mean, I think it is. And unfortunately that's where we have to get serious about the administrative state. You know, Trump would talk about it as the deep state, but it, but it's a huge problem. What we're seeing is these entrenched bureaucrats in DC have so much power and authority and they can be used for political ends. I mean, the FBI whistleblowers, I, I have a client that's an FBI whistleblower and just resources are being diverted to, to investigate pro-life organizations, the January 6th, you know, defendants, they're being diverted from real crimes to do those things. And that's where we see this, mm. you know, the FBI becoming this political animal at so many levels. So, I mean, we hear some political candidates talk about, you know, abolish federal agencies, abolish the NEA, abolish the EPA. And we need to have a serious conversation about what the structure of the FBI is, what its purpose is, and what we're going to do about it. I, I'm absolutely. I met with somebody not so long ago um, who worked in the Trump administration, and he talked about this very thing that, that the, this deep state, the administrative state that that Davis is talking about. Yeah, and and I mean, he, he told me he, he he said that he he's been he was in meetings um, where he had instructions from President Trump directly to with with other. Uh, administrative um, organizations, you know, the, 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 the big, you know, acronyms. Yeah. And he, he had meetings with, with directors in which he told them what Trump wanted them to do. And they just point blank said, no. Yeah. yeah. He said, this is from the president. And they would say, we don't care. Yeah. We're not doing it. And, and, and they actually like, and it's like, well, can you, can you fire them? Well, yeah, you can, you, you, you potentially, although there, there's all kinds of protections for them. Yep. Um, uh, and then, you know, you fire them and then what do you get in return? He pointed out the whole thing about the FBI director re replacement, um, was like frequently the people that you will get 
handed as the, the replacement will be worse than the one you fired. That's right. Um, Hydra. It is. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, a, it's a real monster. Um, Davis, I got to ask, when you look at just how deep this goes, I, this is kind of crazy because I wonder, there's a, so many thoughts running through my head, but one of them is, are the FBI and, and Hillary's a pro at this, were they just not good at their jobs? Because Trump still got elected. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. is when you listen, when you mm. see what was thrown. The cards were stacked against the right. Vote. When yeah. you th- see what was thrown right. at Trump, that was only the first election, right? So, <laughs> mm. I mean, and they threw the kitchen sink at him. A collusion with Russia. I mean, you want to take the man out and beat him? How could you? But that didn't even. It didn't work. So, how in the world does he still get elected when all of the bureau- bureaucrats and bureaucracy has their guns pointed at him? I mean, if there was an election that was yeah. twerked and tweaked to work in their favor, this twerked. would, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> then th- it would have been that one. How in the world do they still lose that election with all of this yeah. information, fraudulent information flowing out and control of the media? Oh, I, I, I do think think, you know, I, I, listen, I spent more than a decade now as a criminal defense attorney, and I spent a lot of time saying, look, don't, when when you're seeing something that's just a miscarriage of justice or whatever, often the simplest explanation is just incompetence, right? Incompetence rather than some grand evil conspiracy. I think the issue, if we were to try to look for an explanation of how this happened with the FBI, I truly believe all of these senior leaders in the F never expected Trump to have a chance of winning the election. I think they just underestimated him. So I think they were willing to do the bidding of the Clinton campaign because it was in their political interest, right? In the future, how how are we going to oppress the new president? So I really don't think anyone in the establishment really thought Trump would win. I just don't think they ever gave him a chance. And I think that's that's what happened, I think, in 2016. Hmm. I think this was more than it was. Sure, they were attacking Trump. They were going after Trump. But I just think that the D.C. establishment assumed Clinton was going to win, that it was going to be a landslide. And so they were more. And I think many were just simply jockeying for position or for promotion within the D.C. establishment. So then they didn't underestimate it. They didn't underestimate Trump. They underestimated the American people. Absolutely. That's and so, right. And so now, mm. now this is starting to make, so the guns are really now pointed towards us. Mm. Mm. And so right, right. any, so that this is interesting. So now the pro-life stuff, all that makes a lot more sense. They, they're changing their strategy. How do you, when you see this kind of, um, when you see this kind of wickedness, how do you fight back against it? Because this, this is a long haul. I wonder if we're going to have to mull around the desert until a generation dies off and we have to fill this with godly people again. How do we fight back against this from your perspective? Well, you know, I think we have to pra- take practical steps um, to really change the way we think about things. And we have to start with truth first. Right. We have to start with basic, simple, foundational That's right. truths That's right. first. That's why we go back to Gorsuch and what Gorsuch is talking about here. Yeah. He's talking about, hey, these are the basic foundational truths of our Constitution, how our system is supposed to work. And if we just ignore them in an emergency, we're going to get terrible outcomes. We're going to get worse outcomes. That's the simple thing. Now, you know, I'm I'm a post mill. I would even consider myself a theonomist at this point. And so I do think we have to look at the long game, but we have to start with that basic truth the fundamental truths. That's what we need to be thinking about as Christians. We can't get caught up in day-to-day things if we're not starting with truth because we can talk, you know, we can get distracted by a lot. There's so much in the Durham report that we can get quickly distracted by it, but we we just need to start with basic biblical truths, understanding the world from that perspective and working from there, just like you guys do every day. Uh, you know, I keep... It, it's a good word. I think that our, our the way our government is set up, we are going to have to really get back to local government Mm-hmm. Because it's going to be our sheriffs that protect us from this type of bureaucracy. It's going to be our mayors and our city councils and our local governments that are going to be our shield for us now. And if we don't get back to a local form of government, understanding how that works, being engaged there, we're not going to have the protections that we need yeah. against I, I, this kind of bureaucracy. I think, I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. I, at the same time, I guess I want to even go even closer. Yeah, there's home. some presuppositions uh, I have uh, on that. Well, so. well yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, I want to, I mean, you're, we're not going to get that local sheriff willing to defend us and stand up for our liberties and tell the truth if we don't have fathers who are telling the truth Same. and le- leading their families yeah. and being faithful, keeping their word um, to their wife. 
yeah. uh, to their kids. We're not going to have this if we don't have churches, if we don't have local churches uh, where pastors and elders keep their vows to uphold mm. the authority of Scripture, yep. uh, to defend the flock from right. uh, false teaching and from sin that grows up within it, to shepherd the flock faithfully. Um, it, it begins there. It begins yeah. in the families and then the churches. And it's in, it's in that context that you're going to have faithful men um, who hate covetousness, yeah. um, who cannot be bribed, who yes. cannot be bought off with uh, flattery or, or, or anything else, and who w- are willing to stand for the truth because, um, because their hearts are clean and because they love their people. Um, but, yeah. the, but we have to have those things all together. We, we, we need that kind of... Uh, all those governments working All those together. governments yeah. working together, reinforcing one another, defending one another, standing up for one another. We've got to have them firing on all cylinders, and, and that's, that's the only way that's going to work. Davis, what's your website or a place that people can keep in contact with you and what you're doing? Yeah, the best place to reach me is just my last name, yauntslaw.com, Y-O-U-N-T-S law.com. It's at Davis Yance on Twitter and yeah, stay posted for updates. I've been trying to stay very active on Twitter to get news stories like these, these things we're talking about yeah. today and just encourage people to stay involved, stay aware, look for the truth. And absolutely, our churches cannot abandon the public sphere. We can't buy into the myth of neutrality. We have to stay engaged with the truth. Mm. Appreciate you, Davis. Thanks, yeah. Davis. Appreciate so your work, brother. If you're single, get Thanks, married. Brothers. If you're married, have you some kids. And if you have kids, go baptize them. Until tomorrow, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politic. Looking for a job isn't easy. It used to be that you could apply at a big name tech company and build a great career for yourself. But times have changed. Many of these companies have gone full woke. And if you aren't the right gender, ethnicity, you don't use pronouns, or if you're not an activist for the preferred cause, then good luck. Why would you risk your career on that? At Red Balloon, we're connecting good employees with top quality companies that value you for your skills and your work ethic, not your social activism score. Employers who post jobs on Red Balloon are focused on creating an enjoyable and productive work culture, free from divisive woke mandates. So if you want to find a serious career path without the nonsense, come to Red Balloon and post your resume today because you shouldn't have to choose between your job and your values. That's redballoon.work, where you can find your future. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow. Through the Spirit, God's Word changes lives. It cuts us to the heart and reshapes us. As you strive to read and study Scripture, having a good set of tools can help. From setting reminders for a great reading plan, to word studies and commentaries that shed light on difficult passages, to listening on the go, the Olive Tree Bible app can help you dig into the Word wherever you are. Olive Tree Bible app. Read. Study. Listen anywhere.